Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled to see so many faces, familiar faces and some new faces on a beautiful Friday afternoon in the fall. Um, so thank you for coming and for sharing your afternoon with us. I'm Catherine Frankie. I teach at the law school here at Columbia, and I am part of the collective that um, runs or disruns the um, Center for Palestine Studies. Um, uh, and we have an ongoing uh, important relationship with Adala, the uh, uh, human rights organization lo located in Haifa uh, that works on Arab minority rights uh, within Israel and within the occupied territories. Um, and um, this and other events that we're doing this year relate to um, Palestine legal issues, um, particularly um, uh, the Nakba and law. And I will share with you a little secret, is that it is my hope in the next couple of years that we found at Columbia something called uh, a new field of Nakba studies. So this is the beginning of our thinking about what it means to study the, the Nakba, not just as an event, but as a structure, an ongoing structure, both within Israel and with, um, in the larger um, uh, occupied territories in the diaspora. We all set over there? Ish? I don't want to get us started, Issa, if you're not ready. Oh. Okay, well, I'm going to just keep talking then. <laughs> um, so today we, um, we come together to talk about uh, Nakba and memory, um, and particularly in relationship with, uh, to um, uh, education um, within Israel and within the larger um, uh, territory of, of uh, 48 and the occupied territory. So we're quite fortunate to have with us um, Dr. Iman Abu Hanna Nahas, who is the head of the Department of Education um, at Teachers College in Haifa. Um, uh, it's an Arabic college, uh, Arabic academic college in Haifa. She wrote her PhD um, dissertation on the subject of generational transmissions of collective memory in 1948 war events, the case of internal displaced and non displaced Palestinian citizens of Israel. And she received her doctorate from the Faculty of Education at Tel Aviv University. In an effort to link, uh, uh, to create links between the field of education and political and social psychology, she investigates issues related to the policy of the Israeli educational system and its implications on the national identity of Palestinian students and teachers within Israel. Last year, um, she edited a book entitled Absentees, critical readings of books used in the Israeli curriculum of Arab high schools. This is something I've been working on as well, and I'm putting together reading materials here in the U.S. on both how Israelis learn about Palestine and how Palestinians learn about Israel. And unfortunately, it's not translated into English yet, so I'm, I'm looking forward to finding uh, uh, the chance to talk more um, about this new, this new edited volume. Um, she joined the board of Adela uh, in, in 2014, and we're just delighted to have her here with us at Columbia uh, and in New York. Um, so she's going to speak for, for a bit um, uh, about her work, and once we get the um, uh, uh, PowerPoint going, uh, that will be even better. Uh, and then we'll have commentary from the wonderful, great, thank you, Issa. Okay. The left to advance. Advancing with the left is always the right way to do it. Um, we'll have commentary um, from the wonderful Mariana Hirsch, who um, uh, has, uh, through her distinguished career, written much about uh, memory in many contexts and is absolutely the right person to engage these um, interesting and difficult questions today around the Nakba and memory. Um, she is this year directing the Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality, along with all of her other teaching and scholarly obligations. So thank you for giving us your time today and your thoughts. Um, so after the presentation and the commentary, then we'll open it up for your questions. And I will note that we're recording today's event. The acoustics in this room are often quite difficult, which is why we're using a mic. And so for your questions, we will pass around hand mics so that we can make sure to record them um, uh, for those who might listen later. So thank you so much, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will uh, now share my research with you about the generational transmission of collective memory of Nakba among Palestinians inside Israel. As you all know, the Palestinian uh, conflict is an intractable one, and uh, 
It has lots of issues since, and before uh, the Nakba, we are involved in a very, uh, you know, uh, involving things that I want to share with you, and mainly the memory of this Nakba. My presentation will include uh, a theoretical overview about the emergence of the collective memory, the Palestinians and the Nakba, how do they refer to the Nakba, research objectives, samples, findings, and conclusion. So as, you all, as we all know that societies involved in a contractable conflict develop appropriate psychological repertoire that enables them cope successfully with the conflictive situation. Such a psychological repertoire consists of three components, the ethos of conflict, collective memory, and uh, the collective emotional orientation. Collective memory is defined as representations of the past, remembered by the collective as if and represented as if it was the history of the people, the history of the group. There are two types of collective memory. The official one, which is represented by the official um, institutions and disseminated by official channels of, uh, of media, of communication, and the popular one, in which I uh, basically um, uh, studied. Collective memories are generally organized around uh, major events, in the, on the conflict, such events occupy a central position in public agenda, and they are transmitted via lots of channels, society channels, such as uh, school, family, and other cultural products, such as plays, books, and films. So what about the Nakba, which is my main point? I did study the Nakba and the memory of the Nakba among Palestinians. You all know that this memory has trying to uh, try to be as if to be erased by the Israeli uh, books or we do not as Palestinians study such history and that's why it was very important for me to study if uh, does it uh, is it there is the youth, youth of Palestinians do still remember what happened or what do they say about what happened in 48 the Nakba or the 1940 war events resulted in the Nakba the catastrophe, the immense catastrophe for Palestinians, where half of the Palestinians were just expelled out of historic Palestine, and about 80% of the Palestinians were expelled from the state uh, live, uh, who were living in the part of Palestine that later became Israel. So, out of 1,400,000 Palestinians that lived in Palestine, only 156 stayed inside the what's so called now uh, in um, Israel. For Palestinians, the Nakba represents loss of homeland, disposition, denial of rights, disintegration of society, and process of destruction of their culture. It is their national and cultural trauma defined as uh, when, when people fe feel that they are uh, have collectively, uh, they collectively feel that they have been subjected to a horrendous event and leaves inevitable marks upon their group consciousness, marking their memories forever and changing their future identity in fundamental and irrevocable ways. So, among the, the Palestinians, the refugees that were a result of that Nakba, we have are uh, the internally displaced Palestinians. About 30,000 to 40,000 people, we have no uh, statistical numbers about them because Israel do not consider them as, uh, a refugee, uh, as, as refugees. So we don't have the, the, num the exact number, but we have these uh, 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 internally displaced who live still, are, are still living inside Israel. Uh, they were displaced, expelled from their villages and homes during 1948 and after, and they originated from 44 villages. Their villages was destroyed and their homes were uh, destroyed as well. Now they are about uh, 370,000 people. They are quarter of the Palestinians inside Israel. And in several Arab, uh, uh, their villages were destroyed, their land was confiscated, and they uh, uh, live in shelter villages, Arab shelter villages. In these shelter villages, they sometimes comprise the majority of the village, but they do live in separate neighborhoods. And 
uh, oftenly they are called according to that village. Let's say in Nazareth, we have a very huge neighborhood called Safuria, and Safuria is a destroyed village. So they are still socially outside the shelter village. They, they uh, treat them as uh, refugees, and they call them as refugees. They refer to them as people from Safuria, but economically and, uh, uh, and um, uh, economically, they were really absorbed in that, cult in that villages. So during 1950s, Israeli military forces destroyed. I, I am giving really a brief uh, overview in order to know the, the, the context of what, is, what happened from 1948 till the, uh, nowadays. So I'm just going very, uh, very rapid and very quickly. Uh, Israeli military forces destroyed most of the, the depopulated Palestinian villages, keeping some of the cemeteries, churches, and uh, mosques. Israeli government established Jewish uh, settlements on the uh, destroyed villages. The government also planted forests in order to erase any memorials of what have been uh, of the destroyed villages. Israeli military forces declared depopulated Palestinian villages as military closed zones in order to prevent the return of uh, Palestinians or internally displaced Palestinians to their villages and even the, uh, the refugees uh, in the diaspora. If we, if they, we do not have any traces of the, of the uh, destroyed uh, villages. IDP's land was confiscated by the same laws that were used to confiscate the lands of the other refugees. And since 1948, Israel, Israel uh, do not treat them as, uh, as uh, refugees, okay? They do, they, it did. Israel does not recognize them, does not recognize their rights, but it does, however, recognize individuals when they are prepared to cede claims to their lands and accept compensation. So it means that I will pay you if you see your complaint uh, of your, of your, uh, of your uh, demandings. But as a group, I do not consider you as internally displaced. Who are Palestinians inside Israel? Inside, uh, uh, Palestinians owned most of the land in historic Palestine. And now they compose about 20.7% of the population in Israel, and they own only 3% of the land. Most of their lands were was confiscated. Most of them was, were granted citizenship, but they were subjected to military rule till 1966. It means that uh, travel permits, curfews, administrative detentions, and, expo and uh, uh, expulsion were part of their life till 66. After 67, they contacted Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and since then, they are having a growing collective sense of national minority of, of be, as being part of the whole uh, Palestinian nation in West Bank, in Gaza Strip, and in the diaspora, and uh, refugee camps as well. Since the early 90s, their ethno-national political activism has increased dramatically. But still, their activism is not violent. It is very uh, normative. Tensions between them and the state rose in October 2000 where 13 people were killed just because they protested against Israeli policy of, uh, uh, in, uh, as a response to uh, El Intifada, next, uh, second Intifada. Tension continues to exist with many of them calling the Israel to stop being a state of all, sorry, calling Israel to be a state of all its citizens. So it means that they, they are challenging the state's Jewish identity because being a, 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 democratic, a democratic state cannot be with, together with being a Jewish state. No Jewish democratic. Democratic is for all people, not Jewish democratic. So it means that Arabs are excluded. They are out of the consensus. They are perceived as a demographic threat and danger to, security, to the security of, the, of Israel, and they are deprived of equal rights, systematically excluded from power, and experience continuous uh, exclusion, alienation, and uh, delegitimization. Okay, so actually, Palestinians inside Israel did not mourn the Nakba, and they are not permitted to talk about the Nakba. They are not permitted to commemorate the Nakba. So it was really interesting to know 
what do the third uh, what, what, do, what does the third generation know about the Nakba? Do they, anything, do they know anything? And the, the uh, family's role in transmitting such, uh, such uh, narrative. So my main, uh, the first object of, of my study was to investigate the role of the Palestinian family as almost the sole socializing agent in transmitting such memory. Second, to learn about the nature of the, nat of the narrative of each of the three generations and to learn more about the narratives of IDPs and non-IDPs. I've, I've interviewed 20 families, 10 of non-internally and 10 of internally displaced. I had 60 interviews with 10 families of non-displaced and 10 families of, uh, uh, that have been displaced. I've, in I've interviewed the grandfather, the, his elder male son and his elder male grandson. And I've asked them uh, an in-depth question about their, uh, uh, there was, I have three schedules for the interview. The first generation were asked about their personal memory, what do they remember from 1948? And their popular memory, what do they know, what do they know about what happened in 48? Then I've asked them about the transmitted memory. What did they tell their sons and grandsons? The second generation and third generation were asked, the second generation were asked about the communication they had with their fathers in which they listened to the memory and the communication they have with their sons in which they transmitted the memory. And the third generation were asked about the collective memory they, ha they, they uh, accepted from both their fathers and grandfathers. I've also asked them about the beliefs, values, and values that were influenced by such events. And the impact of 1948 on their lives as they perceive it, and also their participation and commemoration activities, all three generations. Findings, I will begin, first my, uh, my discussion here will go through the narratives of or the transmitted collective memory of the three generations. Then I will make a comparison, I'll try to have a comparison between internally displaced and non-displaced. Though we believe that we are all the same, but I've tried to find, you know, specific points in the narrative if we uh, can find. It was... One question, I need to interrupt, but I'm so distracted. Why only the males? Ah, good, good question. I've, I have a convincing answer, and it will be delighted. Okay, so first of all, I want to tell you that all my uh, Nakba generation interviewees were between their 82 and 89. They, were all, they are all with sober intelligence memory. They really uh, knew how to share, but they all were frightened to death to share anything that relates to the Jewish forces, practices. Okay? They asked me to turn off the recorder several times, especially when they heard something, when they wanted to say something about uh, the Israeli uh, practices. Uh, for them, the whole world has changed. Life has been changed. Some of them to uh, told me this I watched my world transforming before my eyes, dislodged socially and politically, but placed physically, I still. I began learning the language of my colonizers and work among them, often in minimal jo in menial jobs. And it was like getting to know another system. We were fallahin, and now we are uh, workers in, uh, uh, in uh, Jewish uh, factories. It was, they, they shared the difficulty of adapting, of coping with the new existence. The first generation had uh, their experience or their personal experience included two uh, aspects, their psychological uh, coping, adaptation, and their physiolo uh, not physiological, it was a physical one. With the physical one, they, they talked about the exhaustion. All the 20, uh, all the 20 uh, interviewees of the Nakba generation mentioned going out of their homes. Nobody, even those who stayed at their original houses, were forced to go out because they feared to death the occupation forces. And they went to the, to the uh, lands. Of, uh, some of them, my family, for, uh, for uh, an example, went to Lebanon and went back to uh, uh, the new state. 
but it's, they all went out of their villages. I will try to share some of the, uh, uh, the memories of my uh, village, Tarshiha, which was, which was bombed by uh, aircraft, Israeli aircraft in 1948, and lots of them uh, uh, died. So exhaustion, hunger, food, it was... And even those who were in the, uh, uh, the play, uh, not the play, the movie, Wanted 18, did you, mention, did you notice the issue of food, the lack of food, and how important is the lack of food, and the mean and the significance of food? So they, to everyone talked about the lack of food and being hungry. Disease, most of them, not most of them, there were few that uh, uh, reported that their journey was also endangered by sickness and uh, poor sanitary conditions. There's psycholo uh, psychological suffering, fear. Most of them feared, and mainly because of their yasin. Their yasin had a real influence on the people. On people, they they were terrified, and they t uh, left their villages because they felt like, what if I face the same destiny as people from their yasin? So uh, it was very a uh, fearful issue. Uh, and also because of witnessing atrocities. I told you that in Tarshiha, there was a bombing. They bombed the, 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 uh, the village, as well as in Ailaboon, uh, as well as uh, in other places, uh, Sohmata, Deir Qasi, lots of villages. Humiliation, some were imprisoned in labor camps. They were prisoners of war. And others said that we were loaded onto trucks and they uh, just uh, thrown ac uh, us across the borders. So there were also a few of them that uh, uh, lost their relatives. Okay, I know someone whose uh, sister got uh, sick and he lost her. And also the sorrow of detaching their relatives. I remember that one, one of them told me, I never seen my brother. He died in one of the Syrian refugee camps. And when I met my sister in 1998, it was, very, it was a very sad meeting because it was the first time I, in life I saw her and we felt like strangers. View of the events. How do they perceive the causes of the event? As weak versus the strong Jewish occupying forces. They were equipped, Jewish forces were equipped, they had military weapons, we had nothing, only few pistols that, uh, that, was, that were very uh, uh, unofficial. Betrayal and conspiracy, Arab states didn't do enough to prevent that happen, and Western states supported the establishment of the Jewish state on the Palestinians' lands and on the Palestinian behalf. A strong inter international uh, pro-Jewish bias. The Jewish committed atrocities and massacres. Look at these two. Uh, this one told me. I've heard about a lot of massacres committed by the Haganah in several Palestinian villages, villages such as the Yassin, Sa'asa, and others. Palestinians pl fled out of fear. We knew about the Yassin, so when we heard the bombings near us, we were frightened to death. We had no guns, and there was nobody to defend us. The, this is why we got afraid and left our homes. As we heard the word Ajul Yahud, the, Jewish, uh, the Jews are coming, okay? Uh, the Jews are coming, we got horrified, okay? So uh, the, this is the way they perceive uh, the causes of the defeat. Their self-perception. I've noticed that we have two opposite self-perception attitudes. One is helpless. <coughs> We were like chess dices moved forcefully from one place to the other according to the master's plans, and luck was our lord. Okay? While the other one is positive self perception, we were with standards, we fought, we tried to defend our village. One of them said, we fought defending our families, children, and people. So we continued with, uh, with our f fight and didn't th retreat. The Birwe, there is a village uh, called Birwe. This is Mahmoud Darwish's uh, village of origin. And it, wa and it was like the last one to be, uh, it was very, there was a very harsh battle between the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian fighters. Uh, 
between quotations and the Israeli occupying forces. And uh, someone said the Biruwi was a separating line between Jews and Arabs. So we tried all our best to defend it. We were forced to defend it collectively. All of men from the neighboring villages volunteered and hurried to help. People from Majdlikrum, Sajur, Der Hanna, ta ta ta, but don't, don't think that they had weapons. They had nothing. They only tried to defend by their bodies the uh, the occupiers and the uh, forces. Transmission of collective memory. I, I just noticed that there was no deliberate transmission. They didn't mean to transmit their, their collective memory. But uh, they had difficulties mainly sharing their kids, the, the, f the second generation. Because what? Someone told me, do you want me to share that I was present, I was thrown? It is the, very humiliating to share this humiliation with my son. So they didn't want even to share it, to share this information with their kids because they are afraid of politics and to be uh, under the, you know, the Shabak's uh, uh, security angel, agent's uh, scope. There were, uh, there was, there was a more frequent reminiscing with ch grandchildren than with children. So when I have, when I've asked them, what did you tell the your son? They told me we talked about our personal and individual collect uh, memory, but not uh, something about what happened to my family, going out of the village, and not the, a detailed story. And we also talked about the Yassin and other uh, incidents. When he talked with his grandchild, he mostly shared his individual experience, okay? His, exp uh, his individual hardship during 1948, and his uh, um, um, nostalgia to the uh, village of uh, origin, mainly among IDPs. So the IDPs um, uh, shared information about the village of origin, specific location, holy, uh, city, uh, holy sites, and cemeteries. It is important to note that for IDPs, it is important to talk about what happened because they have to justify why are we here? Why do they call us Safuri? Okay, so I should talk more about what happened. That I sh and it really gives the, the meaning of we are not from nowhere. We had origins, we had roots, and it is very important for us to indicate this. The second generation collective memory, the same points raised by the first generation, but they mentioned a new theme. This new theme is Zionist planned to expel Palestinians. So the Jewish forces used three uh, different strategies. The first one was land acquisition. In order to gain their goal of acquiring larger spaces, Jews made all efforts to buy pieces of land, even from the Turks. They made their best to gain as much land as they can in order to convince the world that they didn't occupy this land forcefully. So they bought lands. The second strategy mentioned by the second generation was frighten frightening villagers. They used to enter the village, kill 10 to 15 people, commit massacre to frighten the people, and make them run away, like what happened in Labun or Tarshih as well. Circling the village from three directions and keeping one door facing the uh, northern uh, uh, borders, Lebanon and Syria, in order to go there. What about the transmission of the, of, of the collective memory among this group? So, for, they told me that they listened to their parents' stories, the individual and the collective, but to their, to their children, they mainly talked about the popular collective memory and they shared more about recent uh, uh, wars, okay? Whatever in Sabra and Shatila, and even in Lebanon. Whatever happens to Palestinians, they share their children that this is occurring again and again, recurring again and again. IDPs, the first generation, talked about displacement, life before 1894, village of origin and relative living in the diaspora. But from second to third, they didn't mention this because they didn't experience it, but they talk, the, the new element was the right of return. The right of return was not mentioned by the first generation. It was mainly mentioned by the second and the third. 
Okay? The need, as if I am telling you this and this because we have to be back to our villages of origin. I am from uh, Iqrath and I live in Haifa. Why should I? I have lots of lands. My father was the Mukhtar in that land. And I have legal uh, uh, issues and rules and laws that enables me to go back. But the Israeli, Israelis are, permit, are forbidding this from me, preventing this from me. Sorry. Third generation, they have much more frequent uh, um, talk with their grandparents. They talked mainly about three points. The Jews had committed atrocities, Palestinians fled out of fear, and Zionists planned to expel Palestinians. So this new theme of a planned uh, evacuation of Palestinians was mentioned mainly by the second and third generation. The Jews came to Palestine, they invaded the Arab villages and expelled the villagers. They used to kill people and to frighten them. The Jewish state had a plan to empty the state from its Palestinian people. For them, uh, they told me that the, they listened to the individual memories of their grandparents and to the collective memory, uh, popular collective memory from their parents as well, from grandparents and parents. But uh, uh, for, for IDPs, it's not mentioned here, but uh, it's not... Uh, it's down there. Uh, the right of return was mentioned as a point uh, transmitted from the second to the third. Second and third generation self-perception is different. I didn't listen to, I didn't hear the, the theme of helplessness. No. It was with standards. We are with standards. We are the standstill generation. Staying inside Israel was a brave act. Can you imagine Israel without its Palestinian indigenous people? Do you think that anybody will believe that it is our land if we cease to live here? So it is a positive based perspective that they, although they have also, I will talk about it, a self perception of victimhood. But victimhood is not like we are victims, but we. We, we acted. I, I, now we are victims of what is happening even now, but we are with standards because we stayed here inside uh, this piece of land, our homeland. Younger generation have also related to the material dimension of suffering as la land loss and land uh, uh, shortage. They perceive themselves as victims of victims. We are the victims of the Holocaust vi victim. And it is a collective feeling of being unfairly, immorally, and unjustly treated uh, this way. And they relate to an ongoing suffering, becoming a, a detested minority, a threat, uh, and discriminated one in terms of employment, housing, and uh, education. The perceived functions of this collective memory is very interesting because, as we know, uh, sorry, uh, not here. <laughs> here, I will talk about how do I ask them, how do you perceive the importance of transmitting this memory to your son and grandson for all uh, generations? The first generation, second generation, and th third generations that say that it is important to share this memory because we shall kept alert. Okay? What does it mean? It's, if we share this, it signals potential future harm so that the coming gener generations should be cautious and conscious of similar negative experiences. Talking about the Nakba is not solely relevant to the past. It is more about trying, it, uh, tying the past with the present. The third generation must learn from his grandfather's mistakes. And there was someone who told me a wise man shouldn't be bited twice by the same snake. This is a quote in Arabic, okay? The second one is solidarity. It bonds the Palestinians together on the basis of the present threat and the past Nakba. Third, it increases its in-group cohesiveness. And it is very important to note that because of the fact that they listen to, the, uh, to, the, to this story from their grandparents, it means that this, is, this history is not history. It is a viv vivid thing. It is... Uh, given fact, reality, whatever, they perceive it as a very so, uh, a source, um, trustful th source. And patriotism and mobilization, being uh, reminded of past violent acts, indicates that they could recur. 
Thus, younger generations in particular express their readiness for various sacrifices in order to defend their land and their existence in their homeland. I just remember that once one, one of them told me, if I am asked now to go out of my home, I will not. I will never do it. I will never have the same uh, fault that my parent did. He left his home as if he trying to blame him, uh, as if, and he knows that it is not to blame. He's not to blame, but he tells me that on my dead body, I will not leave my home. Control, uh, and, then, and then so I move back to uh, the reaction or the impact of such a uh, self-perceived victimhood on the, young, uh, on the young generation. As we all know that feelings of anger among the younger generations and their sense of relative deprivation and their readiness to, uh, to make sacrifices could mobilize them in a moment of crisis to rebel, protest, and commit violent actions. But, however, the reactions to discrimination, humiliation, and frustration are still strongly, strongly controlled, even though 13 people were dead in 2000, and now people are being attacked on daily day on, on a, a daily basis. They are still their reactions are still controlled. They do share or participate in legal practices such as approved demonstrations, strikes, and commemoration. The question is. Why don't they act or react violently? Because they are still have something to lose. So-called something to lose is the edges of democracy and the resources. They have few resources living in Israel. Uh, and they have no alternatives. They should, okay? Because uh, they, they don't want to be against the law. They respect the law. But the question is, till when? Hopefully, that the circumstances will change and they won't be uh, forced to uh, violently act. So, do I have time to do the comparison between uh, internally displaced and non-displaced? Two minutes, three minutes? Yeah. yeah. I will... Okay, so, uh, among the IDPs, the collective memory of 1948 was more frequently narrated because they are, they became uh, uh, strangers in a new shelter village, okay? So they had to narrate it must, m more oftenly. IDPs talked about the long-lasting traumatic effects of displacement because they are still facing the influences and the impacts and the effects of such displacement. Issues such as relatives living in the diaspora, land shortage, thumbs up and of relatives, they are all work together to remind them again and again of what happened. And a village of origin constitutes a basic component of their social identity. They are called as Burmani, Safuri. Uh, they, are, they have the nicknames of their village of origin, so there was no way to not to narrate it and talk about it and remember it. The prevailing manner of IDP's transmission is through visits to the village of origin, okay, and mainly preserving the holy sites. The first generation stories are mostly in oral forms. They share it. They tell stories in the diwan among the elderly. While the younger generation participate in demonstrations, they go rallies to the villages of origin, mainly in the commemoration of El Nakba Day. Grandfathers play as a mnemonic community, whereas the village of origin is the mnemonic arena. So both these mnemonic community and arena work together to remind the generations of what happened. Um, IDP's uh, narrative is constructed um, through three uh, important points. The first one is the memory of the lost paradise. They talk about their village of origin as a paradise. It was indeed, uh, with all the memories, with all the ease of life, with all the uh, mastering of life, they, were, they left very simply, but they were very pleased with what they had. The lamentation of the present. Each time we want to build a new house for one of my bo uh, brothers, we talk about the misery of living in such a crowded habitat. They have no lands to build their houses, so they are like one above the other. And portra uh, portrayal of the anticipated return, it is hard and harsh to be erased from memory. 
The experience is, is very strong and humiliating. I don't accept any agreement that ignores the right of return. This is a right that had to be received. To, and to conclude, we can say the, <laughs> that the Palestinian family, both for displaced and non-displaced, played a very crucial role and uh, as a significant role in transmitting such memory uh, among the three generations. The Nakba is embedded in the Palestinian collective memory among the Nakba generation and offspring. There is an evidence that the three generations evolved and, uh, and reconstruct different popular memory with some similarities. A historical circumstances change, the stories take on a new meaning for subsequent generation as they confront new realities. But the main thing that it, is, it doesn't change, the main themes of that memory does not change. They might stress on some points and uh, dismiss others, but the main points of that memory is still strong there. And I want to share you the model of, uh, of how, do, how is uh, this memory constructed and affected by the different contexts that we have. But I will tell you, thank you. I will thank you for your listening. So thank you. It's really a privilege to be here and um, to be in conversation with Iman and to listen to this really important research and which you presented so articulately with so much energy and so thoughtfully, really, uh, such a complex story in um, such a short time. Uh, from my perspective of somebody who studied memory and especially the transmission of memory across generation, I think this idea of studying memory in three generations seems absolutely perfect to me because um, I don't know how many of you know the work of Jan and Alida Asman, who are very well-known German scholars of memory, and they precisely, uh, they make a distinction between what they call communicative memory and cultural memory. And for them, communicative memory is exactly what Iman just talked about, which is um, it's communicated in an embodied form, directly transmitted through stories, through behaviors, through contexts in the home or in the community, uh, from body to body, as it were. The fathers are sitting with their sons or the mothers are sitting with their daughters uh, or with their sons, telling stories about the past and communicating uh, not just stories verbally, but also behaviors, uh, ways of being in the world, and are transmitting uh, especially traumatic memories through, maybe um, not through stories at all, but through silences. Uh, and Asman, the Asmans say that after three generations, which, um, you know, with luck is about 100 years, um, would be, uh, memory becomes institutionalized because we no longer have that embodied uh, form of transmission. And we've also seen that institutions of memory try to maintain some of the quality of this embodied memory. So we have the new museum, memory museums of memorials that are interactive, that, are, that try to engage visitors to identify as though they had been there, as though they were the children or the grandchildren of those who lived through it in some way, to touch us through photographs, through uh, ways that we can relate through our own histories to the history that's being portrayed so that we can keep some of that quality. So that's three generations is, you know, a, a very good unit to study. But it strikes me that we have a, we, what we listen to today is a very different story. Because when the Asmans talk about the three generations, they talk about the memory of an event in the past, often a catastrophic, a momentous event in the past. Um, but... I'm, I don't think the Nakba is a momentous event in the past. It's something that continues into the present. So I'm trying to figure out how we can conceptualize the mem this, your structure of studying memory when really, as you showed in the transmission from the second to the third generation particularly, uh, something very different, which is that the, the event in the past gets shifted, compounded, transformed by current events, by more recent wars, by a structure of persecution and humiliation in the present that then um, gives a, some, you know, shifts the importance or the shape of that past event. So the, the past event is continually shifting according to the present. Now we know memory is in the present, but I don't think that we can conceive of the event, and not just the Nakba in general, I, I think you know, the, the meaning of event has shifted 
as we conceptualize history such as this one, it's no longer a punctual moment that we can date 1948. And notice that date 1948 keeps coming up, but it's 1948, it's 1967, it's 1973, it's 2000, right? I mean, there are all these dates together, and when you start adding all this up, you no longer have the memory of just one event. So yes, the grandfathers have these stories, but as we could see in your narrative, the stories also get adapted, and they tell somewhat different stories to the sons and somewhat different stories to the grandsons, because they know that these, the sons and the grandsons have lived, lived through different things in the present. So I think it's really interesting to try to, um, to keep that in mind. I think, furthermore, I think these stories are being told and these memories are being transmitted in a very particular context, and the context is the lack of acknowledgement um, and the inability to call the Nakba the Nakba, right? I mean, to, to even the name is being contested of what this history is. How we, what happened in 1948? Is it the formation of the state? Is it the, um, you know, is it the Nakba? What, what is, what do we call this event? So in the absence of acknowledgement where we have, it seems to me, in the state of Israel, competing narratives and competing memories, competing names, for a certain moment and for what happened afterwards, I think that also shifts uh, tremendously. So you've talked about the family as kind of the main site of transmission, in addition to some commemorative rituals and the Nakba Day and so on. But it seems to me that in, within the story of a state, uh, and you're working in this, you know, education, which, you know, how we tell the story of the past in our schools and universities is really important, um, then the memory of the Nakba becomes a counter-memory, right? So it's, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's not there officially, but in the um, families and communal organizations, it becomes a counter-memory yeah. counter that challenges an official story. But it doesn't have the status of a memory. It really only, only can have the status of a counter-memory because it's the memory of a minority, of a persecuted minority population. So I think that's also really, really important. Um, and then that leads me to ask the question, what does it mean to perpetuate these memories in a context where there's no official acknowledgement, also no listening? You know, so the listening happens in small um, communal and familial context, but it's not happening in a larger context. So I've been, I found very useful um, the legal scholar Martha Minos. Um, she wrote this wonderful book, Between Vengeance and Forgiveness, about transitional justice. And she asked the question, what do we owe victims and survivors of mass violence and historical trauma? And she said, in order to address their needs, their own personal and communal reparative needs, she says they need to be provided with a venue to tell their story and be heard without interruption and skepticism, that's the first. And second, a commitment to produce a coherent, if complex, narrative about the entire nation's trauma and the multiple sources and expressions of its violence. So it's the individual story and then in, inserted into a larger communal history and the ways in which these, the individual and the communal kind of work together to form a more complex um, group narrative. Now, in the absence of an official acknowledgement that kind of listening can only happen in small context, it cannot happen in a more official way. And it seems to me that that also compound, then somehow troubles how the memory can be transmitted and, and what kind of memory gets transmitted. So, um, so the question here is, um, you know, this is sort of my first point about this event as an event that is actually continuing into the present and the shifts that the past undergoes in relation to this evolving event in the present, not its after effects, but its presence, really. So I'm wondering what to call this and how we can conceptualize this, not exactly as memory. I mean, I think there's something else going on. I'd like to find a, you know, a term in which to think about this, because yes, the fathers and grandfathers have individual memories of a moment, 1948, but they have lived through um, you know, several generations of continuation of this. So this was my first point. I have two more brief points. My second is a question that's just been asked already, uh, which is that we're hearing the stories of three generations of men. And I know you have an answer to why you structured the study that way. I'd like to hear that. But I also want to try to think about what different stories women 
tell or might have told or how the narrative would you know how we would listen to the narratives of women and what what um, what they might what that that might illuminate for us whether we have um, you know different aspects of the story that that would come up so that's just a, a very quick question and then my third point also very brief is you know I picked up on this line in your presentation which is that they consider themselves victims of victims so I really want to think about what that means and you know that was one moment in your presentation but then there was you know really a very different kinds of self conceptions of being a fighter a patriot a partisan uh, of being not the fighter against the victim but against an aggressor so there are many different kinds of um, self perceptions and perceptions of the other that circulated here but this idea of victims of victims is really interesting and um, I think that it implies at least some amount of recognition that the Holocaust was a foundational event um, for the state and that it existed and that it somehow engendered some of what's going on here um, but then, you know, that leads me to ask, what does it mean to build this state on two foundational catastrophes that in somehow we cannot actually bring together into one paradigm because they're, they're producing really competing paradigms? So what would it take to listen to each other in that way? And so in addition to that, as a student of the memory of the Holocaust and the transmission of the memory of the Holocaust, which I've, has preoccupied me for a very long time, I've become really sensitive to the pitfalls of using victimhood as a basis of identity and the, and, and the perpetuation of that. So I wanted to ask you what, you know, how you think about that. Because if, if we have victims, victims of victims and competing narratives of victimhood, that sense uh, and, and, and a trauma that is the foundational, sort of the foundational moment, um, the sense of fear and danger that I think is happening on both sides and that um, can lead to, to um, a, 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 a sense of vulnerability that leads to denial and that leads to, um, to a demand for inviolability that's a kind of very masculinist conception, I think, of vulnerability that would lead us to build walls and encase ourselves and, you know, want to be invi inviolable. How one can, you know, get beyond that? I mean, so my question is, how can we move beyond this kind of fear and this avowal that comes from a desire for invincibility, which I think, we, which I think is how the Holocaust has played out? in Israel. Um, so if we take victimhood and trauma as a kind of foundational moment, can we move forward? Uh, and what will enable us to move forward? Um, and so I guess my question, you know, sort of my last question here is what conditions would have to be put in place to mobilize the memories of the Nakba and of the subsequent wars in a way that would enable us to move forward into the future. I mean, I've asked that about the Holocaust, too, because I think it's really important to think about how to move beyond um, the, the foundational trauma as the be-all and end-all and the most extreme and the most, you know, in the history of the world. Um, and to see instead a kind of mutual acknowledgement that would show uh, that would use vulnerability as a platform for interconnection, like a, an acknowledgement of everybody's vulnerability as a platform for interconnection to, uh, to understand the entanglement of histories rather than the separation. Now, I think it's very, very difficult to do that in present, in present political circumstances, so I, I, you know, I'm not asking you to think about specific, but I think what would have to be in place to create the conditions for the kind of listening that Martha Minow talks about um, and for acknowledgement um, and for, um, for a way to dislodge this, these ideas of victimhood and desired inviolability in favor of a kind of um, view of the interconnection of different histories that might seem irreconcilable, but that might in some ways actually be entangled. So those are my questions.
everyone happy to stand? Um, so I bet, I bet we have some questions. Uh, we've got a couple of mics up here, which I'm going to ask Liz, I think, to take, use one of them for questions to pass to those who do. And I would, I would ask you that you actually ask a question, not just raise your voice at the end of a statement. <laughs> um, and you keep it somewhat brief um, so that we can make room for everybody Can't else who may have questions. Yes, do, do you, would you like to respond to any of her commentary and questions? I think there are plenty of us who would like to know what your thinking was around the gender issue, but also the other issues you, that uh, Mariana raised. Okay. So, um, beginning with the research I've tried, do you hear me? Come. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Okay. In the, in the beginning of this research, I have uh, a few interviews with women who um, experienced the Nakba and experienced to be out of the borders and to be thrown across the borders together with their families. The stories are a bit different, and they are much loaded with emotions, feelings, cryings, and a very deep sense of bitterness. And I know that women, lots of research and lots of stories and lots of narratives have been, I know that uh, women have been asked about their uh, uh, memory and lots of them talk about it. And we know that women are much talkative and they share. So my, uh, my question was, do men who do not talk, who are not talkable and who do not share mainly their humiliation and the thing that they were, were uh, pr uh, prisoners of war or being thrown across the borders, do they share? Because the women, yes, they, yes, they do. And now, for those who are interested, I am having interviews with women, but they have, I, I am having it from another angle, from another, um, you know, uh, it is different. Their memory is articulated differently and uh, it is, as well interesting as, men, uh, as men's narrative is, but I know the question was, I really wanted to know, how is it with men? Those men do not share it. So is it transformed? Do they talk anything about more than, you know, loss of land and uh, I had land here and land there? No, I just wanted to feel, do they talk about their emotions, about the exhaustion, about the humiliation, about the sorrow? And it was into an interesting point to, to uh, study. Okay. Uh, regarding the points, uh, thank you. Okay, uh, they are very interesting. Though I have a few uh, remarks. When you talk, when we talk about memory, we should also um, indicate the term of narrative. I do believe that narrative changes. But memory do not change. It, it changes, you know, the main points in the memory do, the, do not change. But it takes another, uh, it stresses uh, different points. And the Palestinian narrative is being a bit changed, but for those uh, refugees living in the diaspora, the memory is still the same. They were evacuated, they were expelled, and they had no uh, right to come back to their homeland. And for Palestinians as well, the memory, what happened in 48 for them is not questionable. It is for the whole, I, um, I, um, you might not uh, notice that the same points were mentioned, but uh, other, you know, other dimensions were added, okay? Regarding the sense of victimhood, uh, do I, shall I listen to uh, further questions and then ask? Uh, okay, because, uh, yes. Um, Hold on one second. Um, I'm Rami. I'm very interested to know, I mean, the difference between um, the transmitted information about the Nakba between the first, second, and third generation. I mean, do you think that it was affected by education um, and history and media that transmitted a certain type of, uh, of, uh, of memory? And usually, like, that went under Arab censorship, I mean, which is not, I mean, Arab countries like Jordan or Lebanon, they, they, they transmitted a certain type of story and not necessarily the people's or Palestinian people's story. I mean, do you think this was also affected by all of these media schools? 
Listen, I do believe that it, uh, the context is very important and it is really affected and influenced by the context. Even those uh, among internally displaced who, are, who have a wealthy life now, okay, they, they do not narrate or remember the Nakba as, as those who, are, who lack uh, basic, uh, basic things, basic uh, needs. Okay? There is a difference, but the whole story is the same. And I know that, um, listen, in Israel, we have the Nakba, the Nakba law, okay? so you are not permitted to mention it. And it is very important to find that this memory has not faded. Though I am living inside Israel and I have the, uh, you know, uh, uh, this living in democracy, but this is not it because I am not, I'm excluded from the consent, from the the whole scene, from power. I am um, discriminated against, and that's why the same points are again and again uh, repeatable. Right, according, to, I, I, I do, I am sure that uh, parties, political parties, play also a great part in, you know, in the nationality, I, national identity of the young, of the youth. But and uh, now they are less as uh, scared uh, from the Shabak and from the security agents. But again, the same story is still there. If I understood your question, yes. 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 I'll just reject. Um, two, two questions. Yes. One is, you know that there are a lot of terminologies, right? Um, Palestinian citizens of Israel, Israeli Palestinians, Palestinian Israelis, Israeli Arabs. Did you see how the three generations of your interviewees refer to themselves and are there any changes in terms of how they, what's their term of choice when they speak to you and when, when they speak to outsiders, Israelis, uh, you know, oh. Jewish Israelis. And second question is just kind of to follow up on um, uh, your question. You know, the midi, the media of our communication have changed, right, in three generations. So today, when there is, uh, you know, like Palestinian memorial sites online and there, is, uh, there are films that kind of engender and perpetuate Palestinian collective memory, how does that, how did, does that occur in the interviews with second and third Generations, so that there that there are new channels for existence of um, collective media, such as internet and films and. Okay. Regarding the identity issue, uh, uh, among the first generation, the um, religious identity was very strong. They referred to themselves as uh, Muslims uh, in religious terms. But among the second and third generation, there was one term used, Palestinians inside Israel. And now they are well aware that they are not Israeli Palestinians, or uh, uh, they are Palestinian citizens of Israel. And it was very, um, very uh, clear that then for them. Uh, the second question, do you know that I've tried to Google Nakba uh, being in the, state, in the States here during this week? I've tried to Google it. I um, searched www.nakba.com. And what I got? Did anybody uh, try them before? I got the Nakba of the Jews who were in Arab states, who were forced to leave the Arab states. So, so even the Nakba, Palestinians' Nakba, is we shouldn't, if you wanted to Google it, you don't have an answer. Do you want, uh, Yanni? I know that now we have Palestinian remembered and lost of centers like the CPS and other centers who uh, do care to uh, dis uh, disseminate this narrative and the memory narrative and books and, you know, there is a lot of work do doing, uh, which is done, but still, 
it is not enough and it was not mentioned. Only by a few of the third generation it was mentioned like uh, some source of. I was not, uh, I, I didn't only listen to my father, I also read books and, you know. That's the question. Yes. At least I got it. Hi. Um, so this is, I apologize, this is more of a half form question, but I'm really interested in this idea you talked about second and third generation um, Palestinians have this need to kind of return to their land, which I think I was in Israel this past summer, and that's also a really big, big discourse for younger Israelis, this need to kind of make aliyah back to Israel in order to you know, protect their state or to have the state grow. So I'm just really wondering um, how Palestinians kind of formulate that idea and if, you know, if the idea is to return to, uh, at least in, in Israel, to return to your state, like how... How, what is the Palestinian kind of equivalent of that? Like, where are they necessarily um, interested in, I'm sorry, having people return? Does that, I hope that makes sense. Among internally displaced, they do um, repeated visits to the, to the village of origin, okay? So for them, it is really uh, clear that our right of return is, to, is returning to our villages. Why should a person, a Jew, who came from a, from a, a European state to come to Israel and to live, to come to Palestine and to live on my own land in Amqa or Kwikat or any other displaced, uh, and you have lots and why should we Judaize the the, um, um, the the Galilee? Okay, so the villages of origin are the are you know, uh, for IDPs. It's their own right to go to go back there. For the right of return of the rest of the Palestinians, they have their, they have the right. It is their homeland. So this is what I do believe. Uh, we can we can find solution if uh, uh, to to have them all but mainly those who have the right to come back to their places, to come back to their places, and then to find a solution for others. Yes. to make about this. Yeah. Okay. Um, is this on? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the question I was raising, which is, does it, I mean, how helpful is it or how productive is it, how forward-looking is it to um, invoke victimhood as the ground from which we start or the ground to which we always come back? And is there another way? So I think, you know, when you spoke about people as being withstanders or, you know, st staying, um, or I guess resistors, that seems to me a very different kind of self-conception. So I wasn't really talking about who's a victim and who isn't. I mean, that's, you know, that's a, a you know, political question, but I, I was really talking from your work as about self-perception and self-fashioning um, as victims. And I think in, in what I heard in your stories, many different ways of self of constructing one's own image in relation to this history many different ones and it seems to me that um, 
invoking victimhood as the primary one may not be the most productive because then you run into the other person's victimhood and you're constantly in this battle about who has suffered more and who has more rights um, to what, whatever is being contested. So I was just thinking, like, how can we just shift the view a little bit and tell the history, tell a history that is um, responsible but also responsive to the needs of a future rather than... Um, looking back toward the past, and what would the conditions have to be in place to be able to do that, especially when we're thinking about teaching educational institutions, how we teach the history to children, where, where the history starts, whose history is being told, um, who the actors are, and also, um, of course, uh, you highlighted family as the place to do that, but as other people have been bringing up, we also have media and we have other kinds of mediated forms of telling the history. So I think, you know, it's a kind of multi-pronged uh, process. And I think you had a, some thoughts about that. Yes, we talked about it, yeah. Um, go ahead. I, okay, so um, I will go, I'll try to explain what do I mean, or what do did what do they mean by victim of victims and to uh, relate to that point as well and uh, to match between uh, both of you. So it is right that they admit or acknowledge others' victimhood. They acknowledge the Holocaust as uh, something that befell on, the, on behalf of the millions of uh, Jews, but they do not, it, it is not necessarily means that they accept them uh, they, they legitimize their uh, state building in, in their homeland. Okay, they are victims, but why should they come to Israel, to Palestine, to have their homeland? So, okay, to, their, uh, to, to build their state. So they can go whenever they want, but not, mainly, not specifically in, in this land. And they be perceive the, the victimhood. I do believe that they... Here we have asymmetric powers. You cannot ask those who are victimized on daily basis to those who... Uh, it, the, the, uh, victimhood is part of their, majorly part of their history. And if they seize occupation and if they give the right of return and if they uh, give rights to others, so others will, will want to live. Palestinians want to live. They d do you think that people want to uh, uh, perceive themselves as victimhood? I think that victimhood is a kind of functional as well for, for the Israelis and for others. It is functional, but for, for Palestinians, uh, here we have uh, an asymmetric powers, and I believe that the change shall, be, shall come from the opposite side. I, I'm, I do not say that Palestinians are not responsible, but change has to be done by those and who are in uh, in power okay to seize the to, to end the occupation why should they build and continue with the occupation why let me just say i agree with you i agree no no i agree with you completely i absolutely agree with you i mean the asymmetry i mean it's absolute asymmetry so you know my real question was what is the you know what kind of self perception is empowering um and, um, and I, what I heard in your story was many different kinds of self-perceptions that I thought were, you know, um, multiple self-perceptions. Um. Hi, I think what's missing in the discussion of victims, and, uh, victims is victims of aggressors and contemporary aggressors versus his historical aggression. And um, if the Israelis can continually defend what they do because it's in the interest of their uh, continued existence or it's in self-defense, then they never have to own their aggression. And if the Nakba can't be discussed in any sort of public way or even is illegal in private ways, then that aggression cannot become a public discussion. So how can that change so that that can become part of the public discussion in a larger form so that the contemporary aggression or, and the historical aggression of Israelis has to be part of the story, and they're not just victims. Yeah. Yeah. I want to see if we've got some other questions before returning. Yes, Nancy. Of course. 
the art. Um, they do a great they do a great part yeah, in yeah. this, but the, but they are not. Um, we are not our uh, their own uh, objective. يعني we are ben we do benefit from their work, but we are not the main objective of their work because they need to change the attitude of Israelis. And by the way, we uh, we we have you know uh, their work, and they help us with their, their with their work. Yes, but the we uh, are in يعني they do great work uh, in the stream. As well as others. Yeah. I am a bit set on you. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah. I was really, it's a really interesting whole conversation, and I come to it more from the Holocaust education side, so it was very important to come and really start to hear these stories, and I was very struck by your, um, the old quote that man shouldn't be bitten by a snake twice. A wise man shouldn't be bitten by a snake twice, which sounds exactly like never again, mm -hmm. exactly. which is the narrative of, okay. of the Holocaust. So here are two groups of people who have exactly the same mission, the same, you know, a similar pain and a similar mission, never again. So when um, Professor Hirsch was talking about where, how can we reframe the whole thing? It's, it's not like the foundation of Israel was the Jews' fault. You know, it all comes from colonization. I mean, it goes back to England, and so many of the world's problems go back to the different colonial powers. So how do these people see themselves not as enemies, but as human beings who all have a problem, and we start to look for different kinds of political solutions that involve a much larger world? I, hope I don't think you have an answer to that. But. I hope not. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think she's just said it. I mean, I think we have to end the occupation before we can talk about, you know, I think, you know, there's the political solution has to precede some of these things that, you know, how to frame the narrative is, you know, is interesting to discuss at Columbia, but, um, you know, but there are some facts on the ground that actually have to shift. Right. Right. Hi, thank you very much for, for the presentation. Uh, I think one of the, the terms that was uh, raised, that I think, by, by Marianne in her comments was, was, a, was the term acknowledgement and the lack of acknowledgement that, in a sense, is felt by Palestinians ab about the Nakba and, and, and other events, but particularly about, about this event. Now, uh, Nancy's uh, interference before it was, was, was very interesting that there are actually groups now that are beginning to acknowledge what, 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 what is happening in, within Israel. Uh, but I, my, my question really has to do with a, a, a different model, which is perhaps a model that, that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa uh, mm -hmm. presents, which is to have a hearings, in a sense, which the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did, which were human rights hearings where people would tell their stories and that would become part of the national, in a sense, the new national history. It would be acknowledged, it would be heard by everyone, you cannot deny that this happened. It's, it's all over the, it was all over South Africa. The, you know, the, the second thing was, of course, an amnesty and the third one is, is, is some kind of reparation. Now, it, with something like that, some kind of national acknowledgement, be a first step that would perhaps break the, the, the impasse of, of these two uh, narratives that clash against each other but in a sense don't hear each other or don't want to hear each other. Would, would something like that be a model there, some kind of, of, of national hearing uh, that would present the, the stories for... I believe that it is more than it is. It's great. I think that I believe that what happened in Ireland or in other places which had intractable conflict, and the fact that these conflicts are gone now, it means that it might happen, and there is a hope that it will happen. It will happen, but I believe that this is not enough. Acknowledgement is the is not the main issue. It is very important, crucial, but not enough. Because there are rights to be given, there are acts to be made, and there are lots of things to be uh, on the ground. And not to acknowledge only the story of mine, 
It is important because I, this is part of my identity. If you ignore it and if you want me to, uh, to forget about it, this is inherited here because this is me. This, I am a Palestinian. Why? Because uh, there is Palestine and, you know, it's pa part of me. So you can, you should first acknowledge it and then basically, and then ma many things should be. But it, you are right with, uh, with uh, it might be. Interesting to check, but uh, let's see. I just wanted to ask one question, if I can uh, abuse the great power I have as moderator, <laughs> which is to draw out both of you for a second on the difference between memory and remembrance. Um, uh, and, you know, Mariana, you are more, you know, you are, you've defined the field in so many ways in your work, and so I uh, know very little about it, but I do know there's a distinction made between memory and rem remembrance. Memory at times um, uh, implies a kind of facticity, that it's telling a truth from the past, whereas me remembrance is more of a political project, an emotional project, uh, 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 the, the uses of memory for maybe contemporary political or other purposes. Um, and I think some of what has emerged from this discussion is that it, it, memory is that too. Um, it, is, it is always something that is politicized, that is massaged, that is used, that is updated, as Mariana said, in light of current events. It doesn't have a facticity that um, somehow makes it true in a particularly special way. Um, and I think the, the pressure that was, was put on you about gender um, also teaches us that even something we might call memory is a gendered thing itself. And you'll hear different stories from men and from women um, ab about the meaning and the, the facts of, of the Nakba. So the last piece of this I want to ask you is about Oslo. Are there ways in which, you, in what you've seen, or really any of you, and there's so many experts in the room who can testify to memory and uh, remembrance having to do with the Nakba, um, are there ways in which memory or remembrance has shifted after, in the post-Oslo period where we have the PA, with all of its warts <laughs> and, compli and complications. And, and, and the part of the Palestinian narrative is no longer only an absence, but there's a new presence, mm -hmm. and a complicated one. And, uh, and, and to what extent does that contemporary political presence in the West Bank and Gaza um, affect the way that Nakba may be remembered um, as a contemporary political project? which is uh, not the PA, and, but before that, the effect of 67 and the opening, because the Palestinians in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan had different um, experiences. I mean, the Nakba memory is the same, but after that, they were, there was a political narrative. The, the, the Syrian government or the Jordanian government, it was a public there was a public story, so they, it wasn't repressed. Whereas the generation that stayed in Palestine, the first generation didn't talk about it. The ones who left did talk. So there must have been also an influence on the people inside in 67 when they were able to talk to the others and where the channels were open. So did you see that? The same question as Rami's one, right? The yeah. one who left also. Yeah, yeah. The shifting, the shifting, yeah, yeah. The coming together. Of it is interesting, you know, uh, to do such uh, um, research among those who are in uh, refugee camps with the generational transmission and to see the, uh, w the similarities and differences if, if uh, we have. But it is really imp and interesting to... I did. The, I never thought about it this way, but it is worth worth studying the, this uh, issue. And regarding the shifting of the, uh, you, 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 after you, Oslo. exactly after us uh, after Oslo, I believe that that uh, phase of time was not enough to change narratives. Okay, since the beginning of Oslo, there there has been some change. Yes. Okay, the the um, the the strength of you know the the way they talk the 
there was a change, there was a shift. Let's say uh, the, before the peaceful relations between Jordan and Israel or Egypt and Israel, things were different. After the peace uh, uh, agreements, things have been changed not on the public level, but on the higher levels, there has been some change. And if you see, if there, if context changed, I believe that there is a change. In Oslo or, or after Oslo, we can feel that some change had happened, but it was not enough because truth, we are in the second intifada. So it, it, there was no enough time to have or to follow up this shift or this change. Mm -hmm. I hope that. Uh, I mean, just to say, I think that you answered this question a little bit earlier when you said that, you know, there was a kind of larger national self-recognition after 67, right, when the, you know, people began to have a kind of movement in common. So I think that was part of your answer. Yeah. One last question, and then we're going to have to um, yes. uh, wrap up formally, although I would encourage folks to stay after. I mean, um, yeah, here. Yes. <laughs> Um, I, think, I think many of the questions were uh, aiming at, at um, you know, at, at a more critical perspective on, on, on the kind of information and narratives that you got. I mean, I, 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 I would have liked to hear about who are these people, from where they are, how are they divided along social and economic and historical lines, yeah. and what is the role of power structures, regional, but Palestinians also, power structures in the configuration of this narrative. I think uh, you didn't justify very well your, your distinction between narratives and memories, and somehow you tend to essentialize uh, me Palestinian memory, extrapolating the recollections from some group of people of whom we don't know where are they from or what, what their roles in the new institutions, PA, et cetera, are. Um, so I would have liked to hear a more uh, contextualized and critical approach to the narrative that you were uh, hearing. In a way, this is an invitation for a second lecture. I <laughs> Yes, Emilio. But I have, uh, yes, yes. I, uh, the, the point is very important. You are right. I should have give this background, and I'll uh, put it in some way for my next lecture. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for Thank sharing you. your work with us and to Professor Hirsch.